Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, for a year, Canadians across the country have been in various stages of lockdown. Opioid overdoses are up. Canadians are feeling increasing strain on their mental health. They deserve a serious, data-driven, safe plan for reopening. How long will the Prime Minister keep those Canadians waiting? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way during this pandemic, this government has been there for Canadians. We were there for families, we were there for workers, we were there for small businesses, we were there for provinces right across the country, and we will continue to be. With uh, tens of billions of dollars transferred to the provinces, uh, support directly for Canadians, uh, all the while grounding ourselves in the best recommendations of science and experts. That's what we will continue to do. We're all looking forward to a better summer, Mr. Speaker, but to get there, we have to work together uh, to make sure we're uh, pushing back on those variants, getting everyone vaccines, and keeping healthy. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, tens of thousands of Canadian small businesses are hanging on by a thread. Lockdowns are hurting main streets across the country, and family-owned businesses are in crisis. This has had an impact on the country's physical and mental health. The Prime Minister needs to commit to a data-driven, safe plan for reopening to give millions of Canadians hope. Where is the plan and when is it coming? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way we have been there to support Canadians and every step of the way we will continue to put both the protection and safety of Canadians and uh, the uh, benefits of our economy at the front line. That's why we are deeply informed by experts and uh, scientists in how we move forward. We will continue to ground our decisions based in science and evidence, unlike the Conservative Party that continues to doubt the use of masks from time to time. Uh, we will continue to stand up for Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the government's chief scientist doesn't agree with the Prime Minister's political decision to delay second doses so he doesn't follow his own edicts here in the House. Taiwan has a plan for rapid tests and has been open. The United States and the United Kingdom both have fully published their plans for a safe and effective reopening. Why not in Canada? This Prime Minister has been slow on the border, slow on rapid tests, behind the entire developed world on vaccines. Why are we also going to fail on the economic reopening? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the very beginning, we knew that the best way to ensure that our economy would come roaring back is to be there sufficiently to support Canadians, small businesses, workers, families, seniors, youth, through this crisis. That's exactly what we've done. And every step of the way, we have deferred to scientists and experts. Uh, we also respect the provinces that make their own determinations around spacing of intervals of doses. We will be there to support them every step of the way. Way. Mr. Speaker, Canadians have a government that is there for them. We will continue to be there for them. The, right, the Honourable Member of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président, depuis un an. Mr. Speaker, for a year, our country has been under lockdown. Canadians are suffering. Pressure on mental health is increasing sharply. Domestic violence is increasing. No plan for rapid testing or for mass vaccination campaigns. That means there is no hope. When will the Liberal government decide to have a plan for a safe reopening for Canada? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The Conservatives in this place often say that the government has not acted when it comes to rapid testing. On the contrary, for months and months, we have sent millions dozens of millions of rapid testing kits to provinces and territories, to the private sector, even to individuals. We will continue to be there to give access for provinces and territories and individuals to every means available, and we work to protect our citizens while spring arrives. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, many countries have plans for their economy to reopen. Taiwan has rapid testing. The United States and the UK have reopening plans for their economies. 
In Canada, we have nothing. We're still waiting. We're trailing behind. And we are tired of waiting for everything. Will the Liberal government present a plan to Canadians for a safe reopening of the economy? If yes, when? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, at every step, we are not only getting ready for, to produce a plan, we are implementing a plan every step of the way. We are working hand in hand with provinces and territories, but the leader of the opposition wants to talk about plans for the economy. Unfortunately, what we saw this last weekend is that he still does not understand that we can't have a plan for the economy if we don't have a plan to fight climate change. The Honourable Member for belle chambly Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't know if hand in hand is a little exaggerated, but spring has led to some delightful surprises, including collaboration between the federal government and Quebec. 500 million for high speed internet in Quebec's regions transferred to Quebec, which will get that set up before 2022. My goodness, that was in the Blocks program in 2019, and we are pleased to see it. Now, this delightful and budding openness apply to health transfers that have been unanimously requested by the Quebec National Assembly and every Premier in Quebec and Canada, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of the pandemic, we've been working hand-in-hand -hand with the provinces on investments and expenditures that are necessary to get through the pandemic. Billions of dollars have been transferred to provinces and territories to help with dealing with the pressure on our health care system. We will continue to be there to work with provinces to help Canadians throughout the country at the same time. Once the pandemic is over, we will have discussions on how to increase health transfers to make sure that Canadians are well served in the years to come as well. The, Deputy de Belle -Chambly. the Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Logically, Mr. Speaker, it's not after the pandemic that we need more money for health. It is during the pandemic. However, let's trust in the coming spring. Premier Legault, who was treated as a white supremacist, we denounced Quebec bashing. That's great. And now what? What gesture do we make to make that real? How do we affirm the message to all of Canada that Quebecers are not more racist than anyone else, including the Prime Minister of Canada, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, I want to come back to what my Honourable colleague said at the beginning of his question, which is, now is the time to transfer money to the provinces for their health care systems, not the future, because we are in a pandemic now. And that's what we've been saying from the beginning, and that's what we have been doing from the beginning. We've transferred dozens of billions of dollars to help Quebecers, Canadians, get through the challenges to our health care system. We will all be there for Quebecers and Canadians now and in the years to come. That is a promise. De Burnaby. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Après, après avoir su y avait des plaintes After becoming aware that there were complaints of sexual misconduct against the Chief of the Defence Staff, the Prime Minister not only increased his salary, he renewed his contract. That sends a clear message to women in the Canadian forces that they are not safe and that they are not taken seriously. Will the Prime Minister apologize and prevent such a situation from recurring? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as the government, we take all allegations seriously. We've relied on appropriate independent authorities, and that is what's happening here. After the Ombudsman reported concerns to the Minister of Defence, the Minister then communicated with independent authorities whose responsibility is to follow up on such allegations. It's not up to politicians to make those decisions and make investigations. It's up to the independent authorities to do so, and that's exactly what happened in this case. Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Real leadership is about finding solutions, not looking for excuses. If, as a nation, we took the approach of this Liberal government, looking for excuses, 
then we would have never had universal health care. We know this pandemic has disproportionately impacted seniors. They were the hardest hit, particularly in long-term care. And we know that for-profit long-term care have the worst conditions. So will the Prime Minister show leadership and support our new Democratic Opposition Day motion to remove profit from long-term care so that our seniors are cared for with respect and dignity? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, all Canadians in this House and across the country can agree we need to make sure our seniors are getting the care and treatment and dignity that they so richly deserve. And that is something that we are committed to working with the provinces and territories on. Unlike the NDP, we understand and respect the Constitution of Canada that designates certain areas of jurisdiction as being provincial authority, but we will work hand in hand with the provinces and territories to ensure that right across the country, all seniors get the top quality of care. It's something we all want. It's something we're going to work together in partnership to deliver. The Honourable Deputy House or De Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, a year of lockdowns has had devastating mental health effects on Canadians. Too many have said their final goodbyes to a parent or a grandparent through a window or not at all. We've missed too many funerals and too many weddings. But two weeks ago, the Centers for Disease Control said that vaccinated grandparents in the U.S. can spend time with their grandchildren. Here in Canada, grandparents are looking for some hope too. Will grandparents in Canada who have been vaccinated get to see their grandchildren? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, Canada's response has been guided by science and evidence and has been, uh, has been done in, in partnership and collaboration with provinces and territories. The member of the opposition knows that it's provinces and territories that set the public health guidelines, indeed, in fact, local public health officials that work to protect all Canadians in their jurisdiction. We've been there for Canadians and the provinces and territories. We'll continue to be there for them. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Well, the federal government is abdicating its responsibility by refusing to make recommendations on this, Mr. Speaker, and they need, they need to acknowledge that. For many Canadians, spiritual and mental health are linked. Gathering with people of the same faith and belief has been vital to freedom of worship and good mental health. With suicides and overdoses increasing, people have fewer places to go for help. For most of the last year, more Canadians could go to Costco than to their temple or their church. So, Mr. Speaker, will vaccinated Canadians be able to attend their church, synagogue, or temple? And we are asking the federal government for direction on this, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, the member opposite knows that those decisions around public health measures are related to the public health leadership in that jurisdiction, whether it be provincial, territorial, or local. And we want to thank all the hardworking health care professionals that are protecting all of us during this very difficult time. It is encouraging, though, to hear the member of the opposition talk about harm resulting from overdoses. And I certainly hope it reflects a change in stance by the Conservative Party in their opposition to compassionate harm reduction care. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, last week at FINA, I asked Philip Cross, who was the Chief Economic Analyst at StatsCan for years, if he saw anything in Bill C-14 or the fall statement that would give him comfort that there's an actual plan of growing our way out of this crisis we're in today. His answer, flat out no. After 422 days of small businesses shut down and sector collapses, can this government tell us today what their plan is for economic recovery. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I welcome that question because it gives me an opportunity to share some good economic news with this House. Last week, the ratings agency, DBRS Morningstar, reaffirmed Canada's AAA rating and wrote as follows. Canada's AAA ratings are underpinned by the country's considerable fundamental strengths, including its sound macroeconomic policy frameworks, large and diverse economy, and strong governing institutions. Thank you to Canadians for working so hard to get through this global pandemic. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about underpinning. The parliamentary budget officer said himself, I haven't seen anything yet, at least from the government, on recent measures. When questioned if this government has any outcome-based analysis when allocating government spending. 
no metrics on productivity, growth rates, or spending efficiency, if they are not leading their decisions on economic recovery through traditional metrics, can this government explain exactly what type of tea leaves or crystal balls they are consulting when determining their spending allocation? Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when the chips were down, our government was there for Canadians, and the results show it. Last week, the IMF published estimates showing that without our government's economic response, real output would have declined by an additional 7.8 percentage points last year, and the unemployment rate would have been 3.2% higher. Our government stood by Canadians, and as a result of that support and the resilience of Canadians, the IMF projects our GDP will grow this year by 4.4%. Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister of Health was asked yesterday by myself uh, if vaccinated, fully vaccinated seniors can hug their grandchildren. Uh, today, my colleague, the Deputy Leader, just asked her uh, a very similar question, and she said that it was the province's jurisdiction to make that determination. So I'm wondering if she and her department is planning on any, issuing any guidance on what vaccinated Canadians will or will not be able to do. Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I'll just remind the member opposite that, unlike the party opposite, we do believe in science and evidence, including the evidence that climate change is real. I will also remind the opposite member that it is, in fact, a work with provinces and territories that uh, results in national guidance. The guidance that has been developed with all provinces and territories is posted on our website, and I encourage all Canadians to check it out. The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Well, at a time when we should all be working together to encourage Canadians with regard to vaccine uptake, the Federal Health Minister should be starting to tell Canadian public what she and her department is doing with regard to setting benchmarks on advice for what vaccinated, vaccinated Canadians can and can't do. So again, I'm just going to ask her because she didn't give an answer. Is she planning on issuing, with the on the advice of her department, any guidance on what vaccinated can Canadians can or can't do, or is she planning on completely abdicating this to the provincial governments? Honourable Minister. Well, since the member opposite is talking about vaccine hesitation, I will say this. What I am confident in is the safety of the vaccines that have been approved by Health Canada to save people's lives. And so it's really important that Canadians accept vaccination when it's their turn and that they talk to their health care provider if they have any questions. We know that without a doubt, vaccination is saving lives and we will continue to be there for provinces and territories as they deliver those vaccinations in arms. L'honorable député de Monterville. The Honourable Member for Monterville. Quebec and the provinces are calling for an increase in health transfers, in particular to fight the pandemic. Above all, it is because health costs are constantly increasing, while the federal government's financial share is decreasing, which is leading Quebec and the provinces into debt. Yesterday, in an internal document obtained by La Presse, the Deputy Minister of Employment said that the trajectory of the province's net debt is unsustainable. This confirms that Quebec and the provinces are telling the truth, and the federal government knows it. So why does it refuse to increase health transfers? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think the Prime Minister has been very clear. We've been there for provinces and territories throughout this pandemic, whether it's through billions of dollars in support, direct financial support, purchasing of personal protective equipment, providing additional personnel to help prevent and support people experiencing tremendous outbreaks in their regions, ensuring that we have access to vaccination, paying for all that vaccination. And we will continue to be there for provinces, including Quebec and Quebecers, throughout this pandemic and beyond. L'honorable député de Monterville. The honorable member for Monterville. What the deputy minister, what the minister has revealed is that the government is well aware that despite the deficit resulting from the pandemic, it will have the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7, while Quebec and the provinces are going to debt because of skyrocketing health care costs. The parliamentary budget officer has already established this, so has the conference board, the Council of the Federation, the Quebec National Assembly. Today, 
We have confirmation that the government knows that these people are right, and yet it chooses to continue to starve the health care system by refusing to increase transfers. Why? The Honorable Minister. Monsieur, Monsieur le Président, malgré ce que... Mr. Speaker, in spite of what my colleague is saying, the government is, uh, of Canada is working with the government of Quebec. We've been there in terms of health care. We've been there from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, sending PPE and vaccines. And we will continue to collaborate and discuss with the government of Quebec in the future. We will always be there for Quebec. Honourable Member for Carlton. When it came to light that the Prime Minister approved a half-billion-dollar grant to a group that had paid his family a half-million dollars. He said, listen, this thing was just dropped on the cabinet table, and I knew nothing about it. Is it really believable that this prime minister would know nothing about a half-billion-dollar cabinet submission? Well, actually, yes, it is. But uh, <laughs> until you see this email of, for, that was sent to his top advisor from Craig Kielberger. Hi, Ben. Thank you for your kindness in helping to shape our latest program with the government. What role did the Prime Minister's top advisor play in setting up this half-billion-dollar handout to the Prime Minister's friends? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as has been shared on numerous occasions, the nonpartisan public service recommended that this was the only organization that could deliver the Canada Student Service Grant in the time and capacity that was required. Obviously, the program did not unfold as we intended, um, and all the money that was allocated to the organization has been... Just going to interrupt. The microphone is not picking up well. If I can have the Honourable Minister maybe just uh, start over. Is that better, Mr. Speaker? Much better. Please proceed. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as has been shared, the nonpartisan public service recommended that this was the only organization that could deliver this program in the timeline in, in, the, in the, the, the degree that was required to respond to student and uh, youth needs. And unfortunately, the program did not unfold as it was intended. All of the money that was allocated for this program has been returned, and our government remains focused on youth and students in responding to their needs. It's unfortunate the, the Conservative Party actually has been slowing delaying Bill C-14, which actually will provide interest relief to student programs. So I'm pleased to see their interest in supporting youth and students, and I hope we can continue providing uh, programs to Canadians. Honourable member for Carleton. Well, she says the program didn't unfold as intended. Well, that's because they got caught <laughs> when they were intending to hand money over to their friends. But there they go again, blaming the nonpartisan public service for the program, except for this little email from Craig Kielberger, who says, hello, Ben, senior advisor to the prime minister. Thank you for your kindness in helping to shape our latest program with the government. If these ministers can't give us a straight answer about what role the PMO played in shaping the program, will they let this senior advisor come testify at a parliamentary committee under oath to explain his story? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues knows well that we believe strongly in the work of committees. They have a responsibility to examine legislation, make it better, ask, quest ask questions. And that's why we never turn away from having our ministers appear at committees. And we did so without any hesitation many, many times, and we'll continue doing it. That's how it works, Mr. Speaker. Our ministers are accountable to this part of parliament. The ministers, Mr. Speaker. The member for Charbonneau-Haute-Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister approved a $50,000 bonus and pay raise to the former Chief of the Defense, and Defense Staff even after serious allegations of sexual misconduct against him came to light in 2018. Women serving in our armed forces must surely be baffled after learning of this decision. What message does this send to women serving in the Canadian Forces? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we take our, all allegations of misconduct extremely seriously. And as I stated before, I do not determine the pay increases. That is done by independently um, by the, uh, based on the advice and the recommendation of the public service. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Charles. Mr. Speaker, we're used to 
the response from the Prime Minister sending the problem to somebody else saying it's not my responsibility, it's other people. But now I'll ask the Minister of Defence to go back in time to remember his time is in uniform and would he say the same thing to his women colleagues? Is that the same answer he would give them? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure when the member um, served that uh, he served honorably as well, and I did the same uh, same thing. And we take our responsibility very seriously, the women and men of the Canadian Armed Forces, and that's exactly what we're doing. We have absolutely no zero. Uh, we have zero tolerance for any type of misconduct. We take every um, uh, allegation extremely seriously, and that's exactly what we did in this situation here as well, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The honorable member for North Island Powell River. Mr. Speaker, the RCMP Civilian Review and Complaints Commission determined Colton Bushy's mom was discriminated against when officers told her of her son's death. According to the report, police told her to get it together, then asked her if she was drinking and even smelled her breath. This was said to a mom who had just lost her son violently. Imagine her pain. Reconciliation grows from recognizing uncomfortable truths not symbolic gestures. When will this Prime Minister stop talking and start acting to end systemic racism in policing? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And this is an important question. And, and certainly our condolences and sympathy goes to the Bushy family and the way in which they were treated is unacceptable. We thank the CRCC for their report. But I would remind the member that we have made a clear um, declaration of moving forward on enhanced civilian oversight for all law enforcement agencies, including the RCMP. We're working towards modernizing the training for police and law enforcement, addressing standards and de of de-escalation, people in crisis and use of force. And we are accelerating the work to co-develop a legislative framework for First Nations policing as an essential service. Mr. Speaker, we're acting on, th on these recommendations and we're working to ensure that the RCMP is fully engaged in, in the reform. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. After years of obstruction, the Minister of Crown and Indigenous Affairs finally agreed to an independent review of the abuse of the rights of the St. Anne's residential school survivors, but she made no effort to talk to the survivors, and now we know why. Because the Minister is arbitrarily excluding many of the survivors, she's refusing to let the survivors know if their claims were breached by the government's actions, and she's refusing to provide access to the evidence that her officials suppressed. This minister has already spent over $3 million fighting these survivors. When is she going to end these toxic legal games and just do what is right by the survivors of St. Anne's Residential School? Do the right thing. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the mistreatment of Indigenous children, including those who attended St. Anne's Res Indian Residential School, is a tragic and shameful part of Canada's history. To restore the confidence, rebuild trust, and maintain the integrity of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, Canada has approached the court to request an independent third-party review of the St. Anne's Indian Residential School independent assessment process claims, which were decided without the benefit of Canada's 2015 updated Persons of Interest reports. Throughout any review, Canada will fund health support measures for the survivors. Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, over the past year, Canadians and Canadian businesses have faced an unprecedented challenge. We have, as a country, gone through the worst health and economic crisis in over a century. Our government has been there for Canadians and Canadian businesses every step of the way. And with the vaccine rollout, there is now light at the end of the tunnel. Will the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance please update this House on when the government will present Budget 2021 and the government's vision for the future? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada entered this global pandemic in a strong fiscal position, which allowed our government to provide unprecedented support to Canadians. We will continue to do whatever it takes to support Canadians and Canadian businesses, and we have a plan for jobs and robust growth. I'm pleased to announce that on April 19th at 4 p.m., the government will present Budget 2021. Pursuant to Standing Order 823, I ask that an order, sorry, Standing Order 832, I ask that an order of the day be designated for that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. 
Speaker, fruit and vegetable growers who are bringing international farm workers for the 2021 growing season are being asked to wait in, on phone lines with hundreds and thousands of other people to wait for a nurse um, that's contracted by the government that is to supervise their COVID-19 test at day 10. But if they get through, once the test is complete, they're required to uh, forward it to the lab by Pure Later Courier. So this just in, Mr. Speaker, Pure Later does not serve many parts of rural Canada. And where it is available, uh, they don't work on the weekends. So will this government give fruit and vegetable growers a workable solution for getting farm workers to work? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to uh, reassure my colleague and all Canadian farmers that we are working really seriously to make sure that the procedure is safe, safe for the temporary foreign workers, safe for Canadians. And yes, we know there's a challenge around uh, day 10 test, but I can assure you that we are working on it. We have already put in place additional resources and a line that is specific, dedica specifically dedicated to foreign workers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, the government's hotel quarantine policy is not based on science and is hurting the global work of Canadian humanitarian organizations. These organizations must now pay for hotel stays when they bring their workers home or transfer them through Canada to other locations. Now, humanitarian workers need to be traveling to fight this virus abroad. And that is why Conservatives asked for an exemption for them a month ago. At the very least, will the government support an exemption to this policy for humanitarian workers so that NGOs can focus their resources where they are most needed? Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We value tremendously the incredible work that humanitarian workers are doing on the front lines here in Canada and around the world. The policy that our government has put in place is designed to keep Canadians safe, which is why quarantine measures are very important. However, we stand by the important work that humanitarian workers are doing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Thousands of Canadians are returning from Florida at the moment with their vaccination certificate in hand and a negative COVID-19 test. Mr. Speaker, will these Canadians be able to return directly to their homes for their three-day stay without having to spend their quarantine in a hotel? The Honourable Minister. Speaker, and first, let me remind Canadians now is not the time to travel internationally. It's very important that we have proper public health protocols at the international borders. We are, have some of the strongest measures in the world. It keeps our rate of importation extremely low. And Mr. Speaker, uh, as uh, returning Canadians uh, arrive in Canada, they will be expected to follow the regulations in place for all returning travellers. The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. Mr. Speaker, last week, constituents of mine working in the pipeline repair and inspection services were detained upon arrival into Canada, despite having provided a travel letter and a government essential service workers permit to the CBSA agents. Workers that cross the border for essential work have been deemed essential for a reason. Mr. Speaker, why is this government causing quarantine chaos, locking them up in their COVID hotels, even when proper credentials were presented? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have taken the measures that are necessary to protect the health and safety of all Canadians. At the same time, we have introduced exemptions for workers. Uh, including essential workers to ensure that we can keep our economy going. We will continue to apply those measures with great rigor so that we can both protect the health and safety of Canadians as well as uh, meeting the needs of uh, Canadians economically. Thank you. L'honorable député de... L'honorable member for Lac saint jean Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On January 27th, the House of Commons unanimously called on the Minister of Immigration to grant citizenship to Raif Badawi. On February 16th, I wrote to the Minister to remind him of this. Well, it's now March 23rd and I'm still waiting for an acknowledgement of receipt, but more importantly, Raif Badawi is still not a citizen. Yesterday when I questioned the Minister, he told me that he would continue to work with all members of Parliament. 
Well, that's nice, Mr. Speaker. But to work together, first you have to be working. So, when will Raif Badawi get his citizenship? The Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I share my colleague's concern uh, of concerning Mr. Badawi's uh, detention. We're very concerned about his safety. We are studying the requirements of the Citizenship Act, given that Mr. Badawi is not on Canadian soil. We are working closely with Global Affairs Canada on this issue, and we will continue to work with all parliamentarians in order to re reunite Mr. Badawi with his family. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague, congratulate him on his uh, improved French, by the way. I know that the minister is in touch with Erwin Kotler, uh, Raif Badawi's lawyer. Uh, Mr. Kotler is also a former Liberal Minister of Justice who has represented other political prisoners, such as Nelson Mandela. And I want to emphasize this because I think there should be no partisanship here. We're all here to help release a man who is being arbitrarily detained. Mr. Kotler has confirmed that the Minister of Immigration has the discretion to grant citizenship and that it would help Mr. Badawi's case. He could do so as early as this afternoon if he chooses to do so. So why doesn't he? The Honourable Minister. Once again, I want to thank my colleague for his question. As I have already said, I share um, his concerns around Mr. Badawi's safety. It's uh, not a really easy issue. We do have to deal with it attentively. I'm very concerned by Mr. Badawi's uh, security, and I will continue to work with all colleagues on this issue and continue to engage the community and the family of Mr. Badawi. And I'm going to be working very closely with the Minister of Foreign Affairs on this. Thank you. Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, small businesses have borne the brunt of the pandemic. 60,000 of them have failed. Nearly 20,000 are on the brink. Millions of jobs are at stake. Many need more loans to survive, and thousands can't qualify. But debt is no substitute for customers, and small business debt is threatening recovery. Uncertainty from this government's lack of a plan is killing small business jobs. Will this government table a plan so that small businesses will know when they can have their customers back? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I share the Honourable Member's concern about Canadian small businesses, and that is why I would like to urge him and all members opposite to join us in supporting Bill C-14. This is legislation that will help small businesses, and you don't need to listen to me. You can listen to Dan Kelly, who says, Bill C-14 has some important measures for small businesses. CFIB urges all parties to ensure this support is passed quickly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Well, Madam Speaker, last week at Finance Committee, uh, uh, Philip Cross from the McDonald laurie Institute said there is nothing in Bill C-14 for economic recovery. Uh, this government has repeatedly said that programs like the HASCAP program and the uh, RRF uh, were the answer for businesses that have fallen through the cracks. But the criteria for these programs is virtually the same as the other programs that are failing to reach Canadians. The minister admitted at the Finance Committee that there are nothing in, in, that there's nothing in C-14 for businesses that have fallen through the cracks because they opened. When are they going to table a plan and do something about it? Honourable Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I announced earlier today, we will be presenting our budget on April 19th. But I must take issue, Mr. Speaker, with the simply false notion that Bill C-14 does not include measures to support business, small businesses. It would provide the RDAs with an additional $206.7 million to replicate CBA loan limits for gap filling programs and RRRF gap filling capacity. Uh, C-14 also gives us the formal authority to provide rent support programs for rent payable. Many other important measures there, Mr. Speaker, and I hope all members of this House will support this essential legislation. The Honourable Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Mr. Speaker, recently it was announced that 800,000 taxpayers have been locked to their CRA My Accounts because their account information has been obtained by unauthorized third parties. 
Now, that is close to 1 million Canadians who have been locked out of their accounts, many of whom will rely on it to apply for their emergency benefits or file their taxes. While the CRA has suggested this is just precautionary, it should never have happened. Will the minister ensure that Canadians are not paying the price for CRA's recklessness and make sure this never happens again? Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, protecting Canadians' personal data is a priority for the Canada Revenue Agency. The people concerned by this issue will receive a notification that they need to reinitialize their username and password for their CRA account. This step was taken proactively and as a preventive measure. And let me be very clear, there has been no breach in the agency's system. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Mr. Speaker, we know that Canada remains deeply concerned about the egregious human rights violations that are taking place in the Xinjiang region in China. We're particularly concerned by the reports of forced labour in the region and the ongoing repression and persecution of the Uyghurs. Yesterday, along with the US, the UK, the EU, Canada has announced targeted measures against Chinese officials who have been directly involved in these atrocities. Can the Minister of Foreign Affairs update this House on Canada's most recent actions? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Mississauga East Cooksville and chair of the Subcommittee on International Human Rights for his work on this serious okay. issue. More than ever, democratic countries must stand together to defend democracy and human rights. That is why yesterday we joined our allies in imposing sanctions on four individuals and an entity who have played a key role in the persecution of the Uyghurs. We will continue to call on China to stop the repression against the Uyghurs and to hold those responsible to account. Honourable Member for Medicine Hat, Cardson Warner. Mr. Speaker, pre-COVID, Canada's emergency management experts had a clear pandemic plan. However, this plan was trashed, along with pandemic stockpiles, in our early warning system. And now, Canadians are paying the price for this negligence with the Liberals' plan for the next election. Lockdowns and restrictions are supposed to be temporary to buy governments time to get appropriate measures like rapid testing and vaccines in place. So, where is this government's data-driven plan for a recovery, and why are Canadians being forced to endure perpetual restrictions while we wait for that plan? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as a member opposite knows, we have worked with scientists, public health leaders, and indeed provinces and territories every step of the way to respond to COVID-19 from the early days where we were supporting provinces and territories to acquire personal protective equipment and start up domestic manufacturing to now where we are acquiring the vaccines, paying for them, and ensuring that provinces and territories have the systems to administer those vaccines. Mr. Speaker, we've delivered over 31 million rapid tests. We've ensured that provinces and territories have the money, the expertise, and the support they need to protect the health of the citizens that they are responsible for taking care of. The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Mr. Speaker, families want to be able to visit their loved ones in long-term care homes. Grandmothers want to hug their children. People in Point Roberts simply want to be able to go and visit their doctor or their dentist. The government now has robust data on the efficacy of vaccines. When will they update their guidelines on what are appropriate activities for fully vaccinated individuals? The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the member's interest in the data and science on vaccination. And you're, she's right. We, what we do know is that vaccinations are indeed saving lives, and the data is accumulating that they are a very strong protection for the transmission, for the for the uh, experience of getting very sick with COVID-19. Where the research is still evolving is the effect on transmission. And we will always listen to the advice of public health experts, scientists, indeed, the leaders all across this country that are working so hard to balance the public health measures necessary to protect Canadians during this extremely, extremely delicate time. The Honourable Member for Dauphin Swan River, Nipawa. Mr. Speaker, Canadians want a government that works for them, but they don't have one. Seniors are being left behind, businesses have closed their doors, rural Canada is being ignored, and our vaccine rollout is amongst the worst. Instead of doing his job, this Prime Minister is more focused on keeping his job. Canadians don't want an early election. They want a future. 
Why is this Prime Minister more focused on his political future versus the future of Canadians? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I disagree entirely with my honourable colleagues' assertions. Since day one of COVID, our government has put the well-being of Canadians at the heart of our response. And as the finance minister said today, we will be there every step of the way until we get out of COVID and build back better. As the Minister for Rural Economic Development, I'm proud that we are taking this opportunity in these difficult times to connect every Canadian to high-speed internet, as service that is essential, no government has done more, and to rural Canadians, we've got your back. The Honourable Member for Brom Missisquoi. Mr. Speaker, over the last year, Canadians have had to roll up their sleeves to deal with an unprecedented health and economic crisis. From the start of the pandemic, our government has been there to support Canadians, and we will be there for the recovery to build back better and create a stronger Canada. Could the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance please inform the House when the government will table the 2021 budget and our vision for the future? Thank you. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you for the question. Mr. Speaker, we entered this crisis in a strong fiscal position, which has allowed us to provide unprecedented support to Canadians during this pandemic. I am pleased to announce that on April 19th at 4 p.m., the government will table the 2021 budget. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. A recent CCPA report noted that because of high costs, there has been a sus substantial decline of 10% in childcare enrollment in most Canadian cities. It was most extreme in Ontario. Accessible and affordable childcare will play a vital role in rebuilding our economy and will be essential in helping parents get back to work. The Liberals supported our NDP motion to put $2 billion into child care immediately, yet there's still no relief. Families are used to broken Liberal campaign promises. Is this just one more? Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are committed uh, and we understand the immediate, the immense pressure that COVID-19 has put on Canadian families and particularly parents. We're committed to being there for parents throughout this crisis to ensure that they take care of themselves, their children and their families. That's why we introduced a series of measures to help uh, families through, uh, through this pandemic. But we also introduced measures to help the childcare sector, and we're committed to, of course, continuing our investments, but also uh, a more ambitious plan to ensure that each and every child in Canada has access to affordable and high quality childcare from coast to coast to coast. The Honourable Member for Brampton Centre. Mr. Speaker, compared to other countries, only less than 10% of Canadians are vaccinated, and everyone is concerned. Can the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry explain that, in spite of the rich resources available, why this government could not bring a proper plan for Made in Canada vaccine instead of depending on others? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, it's quite the opposite, actually. Within 12 days that the World Health Organization declared a pandemic, Mr. Speaker, we were already there with 200 million to support made in Canada vaccine and therapeutics, Mr. Speaker. And within 30 days, we added another 600 million. So in fact, Canadians should know that within a month, we had almost 1 billion, which was invested to make sure that Canadians can rely on safe and effective vaccines through procurement and to biomanufacturing in this country, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to invest to ensure the resiliency of Canadians and to protect their health and safety for the future.